Good evening, everybody. Just caught episode two of season three of Fargo, an episode that was called The Principle of Restricted Choice. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I just have to say I am consistently amazed by the power of the writing and the acting in Fargo. I mean, 10, 20, 30 years from now, when people look back at this period, I have a feeling media historians, whether it's film, television, whatever, they're going to point to this show and say the best crime writing on any screen anywhere was on this show. I would argue a show as strong and consistently good as Fargo is as interesting in a lot of ways as the high watermark of film noir in the late 40s through the late 50s, which was really the great juicy classic period where you had things like Double Indemnity to Out of the Past to Kiss Me Deadly. I mean, if you're a fan of hard-boiled fiction, detective stories, crime stories, you really can't spend your time in a better way than watching Fargo because this episode was just killer. I find myself riveted every second of the way. What's fun about great crime fiction, especially in classic film noir, is on one hand you get the sense that fate is sticking out its foot to trip people up. But the more interesting angle is seeing how people, through their own flaws and their own wants and their own desires, become the engineers of their own destruction. And the beautiful thing about Fargo is that rather than with like a tight like hour and a half movie where you gotta wrap up everything pretty quickly, we get to see in slow motion a variety of characters with all two human flaws, slowly but surely tightening the noose around their own neck. And there's usually one or two wholesome, noble people in the world of Fargo to give us a sense of light and hope and that sort of thing. But man, this is a show of moral grays and ethical ambiguity, and I just love every second of it. We got to see a little bit more of Carrie Coon as Gloria Burgle this episode, and I have a weird cross-television show hypothesis that, and this is, I'm only being half serious, but her character in this has a problem with technology, electronic doors don't open, she's not into computers, and I have a feeling that somehow the character Carrie Coon plays on The Leftovers has subjected herself to the crazy radiation that everybody's talking about, and that instead of sending her into the future and leftovers like some people have predicted, instead, it sent her over to the world of Fargo to be a Midwest police officer. So that is my weird kind of multiverse conspiracy theory about the worlds of the, of the leftovers and Fargo, because they're both starring one of my favorite actresses right now, Carrie Coon, who's just killing it on the leftovers. It remains to be seen just entirely what her character is entirely about in this, but she obviously relies upon old-fashioned methods, has a fierce distrust of technology, but does achieve results as we see as she begins to investigate why her stepfather was murdered in the previous episode. And one of the interesting wrinkles of this episode is that her stepfather, who she admits she wasn't close to and was only married to her mother for a couple of years, and he might have been in a previous life or previous identity, a successful science fiction writer named Thaddeus Mosley. Uh, how this will tie into the overall story remains to be seen, but we have to remember this is a show which is not afraid to get weird, as we saw giant UFOs in season two. So who knows what a little sci-fi might do when it comes into the world of Fargo, but yeah, the, more to come on that, I'm sure, in future episodes. So while she might be suffering from some short-term problems on the work front with her department being absorbed by a larger, more modern department that actually does use computers and things like that. She does have a little breakthrough when she finds the gas station where the murderer of her stepfather tore the page out of the phone book and she takes that as evidence. So clearly she is onto his trail, which means she's also onto the trail of Ray Stussy and the great Nikki Swango, played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Quick Side note, this is not really a review, but it's an interesting detail about the show. There was a, um, a lot of people talking online about whether or not Mary Elizabeth Winstead did her own um, nude appearance from behind in the previous episode, or if she used a body double. And as people were talking about it on Twitter, she chimed in and said that she doesn't do all those squats for nothing. So huge salute to Mary Elizabeth Winstead for A, wanting to proudly show off her phenomenal physique, but then taking ownership of it on social media. That was a nice little moment, which only deepened my obsession with both her and her character, Nikki Swango, whose 
not entirely completely all there in the show, but has this amazing charisma that I just can't resist. Yeah, so in this episode, uh, Nikki, she decides that Ray's chi is not flowing and she just can't be around somebody whose chi is not flowing. He's a little bit nervous and anxious about whether or not they're in the clear about this murder. For the time being, it looks as if the murder has gone down as an accidental death. So Nikki comes up with this idea of either, he has to either forgive his brother Emmett or they need to rob the stamp from him. And they decide to do kind of a bit of both where Ray runs a scam, pretends to be making amends with his brother Emmett while Nikki sneaks in to steal the stamp. The stamp's not there, so instead she steals a safety deposit box slip and leaves a used tampon as a little token or fuck you or I don't know quite how to interpret that, but Emmett is shocked and horrified and he and his partner Cy basically decide to excommunicate Ray and declare all out war on him. And if he makes any more moves to try to get money out of them, that they will turn him in for being sexually involved with a woman for whom he is the parole officer. But the real fun of this episode was watching the character of VM Varga, played by the great David Thewlis, starting to really just tighten like a vise his entire scheme around Emmett Stu Stussy and his partner Cy. Because yeah, this guy, he obviously is a cold-blooded criminal and, well, how can I say this? When Emmett and Cy go to their lawyer and ask him to investigate, there's this hysterical scene where the lawyer's trying to Google VM Varga and doesn't even know how to press enter after typing in the name. He's like, what do I do? What's it doing? His assistant comes in, helps him. But as soon as they look up the name, they open this file, which turns into a surveillance like, like thing that takes their picture, and which is terrifying alone. But then shortly thereafter, as the lawyer's walking to his car, these two guys show up and start talking about how they used to be Cossacks and that they used to eat the babies and rape the women of the lawyer's family. And then they throw the lawyer off of a, uh, off a, off a parking lot balcony. And as they walk away, they're kind of punching each other like children. You know, these are two of the enforcers for VM Varga, and Varga does not like being investigated in any way, shape, or form. Soon thereafter, VM Varga moves his hired killers into Emmett's office. Emmett is petrified and doesn't know what to do, but here's where we get a little taste of what makes this show so great. While Emmett, in a rational or normal universe, would turn him into the police or try and find a, um, I guess, the righteous path to eliminating this threat to his livelihood, when he gets a little taste of how much money they might make with Varga, at least on paper, because Varga has all these plans of turning all their parking lots, which are great cash business with very few records, turning them into condos or possibly an athletic stadium, doing all these grand schemes, Emmett starts to smile and relax and starts to listen. And so we already know from here on out, anything that's coming to Emmett, he totally deserves because he lost the high ground morally when he decides that a guy who is murdering his lawyer and forcing his way into his office is someone that he can deal with and work with. So once again, you and McGregor, top-notch work. Carrie Coon, top-notch work. Mary Elizabeth Winstead, phenomenal. And David Thule. I mean, the cast they assemble for this season is truly extraordinary, and I'm just loving watching them in action, and the writing is just rock solid, as always. So, yeah, it is a pleasure and a privilege to check out this show every week and do these little YouTube reviews. And, uh, yeah, if you want to make some theories or make a hypothesis about where this plot is going this season, feel free to do so in the comments below. But I think as we all know from season one and season two, wherever it goes, it's going to be a very surprising, very bloody, very nasty, but very satisfying conclusion. So please give my channel a subscribe if you feel so inclined, and I really appreciate you checking it out. So long.